What's up? What's up? Wait a couple minutes for people to pile in here. <clears throat> To do, do so, so I came across a video today. Come across many videos actually. And guys, let me know if you can hear me okay in the in the chat. Um, it seems high intensity training is making a comeback. Um, I don't know if it's because of. The rising popularity of Mike Menser's videos could have a lot to do with me putting content out there, training with uh, Elliot Holes. High intensity training is making a hell of a comeback. And for good reason, because it works. Now, if you go into my YouTube channel, so here's the thing here's the problem, guys. You're going to see a lot of people coming through the woodwork and they're going to try to teach you high intensity training but you need to keep in mind that they're just hopping on the bandwagon they have no experience in this they don't really understand it but they're going to try to teach you it i just saw actually jeff cavalier from athlete x doing mike mentor style exercises jeff nipper recently just posted a science-based bodybuilding video which just reiterated everything I've been teaching for a decade. So they're finally kind of catching on. Um, but you'll notice, you'll notice over the next, you know, several months, couple of years, whatever, bodybuilding is going to start to shift towards a higher intensity training approach and less volume. And all I can say is, I told you so. Me and my colleagues have known this for years. In my personal training studios, I've supervised over 25,000 workouts using these concepts. But now we're going to have fitness YouTubers jumping on the bandwagon, pretending they understand what the hell they're saying, but they don't. Okay. One of them, for instance, Jeff Nipper. Nice guy, whatever. He was the science-based YouTube channel. Um, just posted a video on, you know, the best way to build muscle. And <laughs> what did he say? Well, he just reiter reiterated high-intensity training principles. Um, and, you know, I saw this video and I go... Like I have a I have a video from 2016 doing explaining this. So remember, as HIT makes a resurgence, as high intensity training gains popularity, watch the content by me, Drew Bay, Doug McGuff, Dorian Yates. Ignore Jeff Nipper, Jeff Cavalier. Ignore these bandwagon jumpers because they, they really don't understand what they're saying, okay? And I'm going to bring up Jeff Nipper's video to explain that to you, okay? What do I think about dog crap training? Well, I think it's dog crap. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I don't even know what dog, dog crap training is. So let's check out Jeff Nipper's videos, all right? Their video. I came across this this morning. I'm like, oh, my God. But... What, what's it start with? Tension is key. Okay. So there seems to be this, you see this word being thrown around, tension, tension, tension. Most of the time they are confusing tension with effort. Okay. Tension is not king. Effort is king. And you'll see later in the video he'll, he'll talk about high tension exercises. No, no, no. Whenever these fitness uh, wannabe experts say the word tension, remove that word and replace it with effort or intensity. Okay. I think what they're thinking is tension is the amount of muscle tension. 
that you're generating by pushing really hard. Okay, but it's just effort. It's motor unit recruitment. When they're saying tension, what they're, what they're talking about is motor unit recruitment, but they don't really understand what motor unit recruitment is, so they say tension. The more motor units are recruited, the more force that muscle's gonna produce, the more tension. So, no, tension is not key. Effort is key. So, um, let's see. He does have some real good quality in his videos. But look, slowing down the negative. Huh, I wonder where he heard that before. So he goes over some techniques, slower repetitions. I mean, these are, you know, pretty lifting tempo, range of motion, minimal momentum. Where have you guys heard any of that before? <laughs> it's just like, no shit, Jeff. Uh, you know, they're, they're just learning this. And they're just learning something that me and my colleagues have been teaching for fucking years. And the reason they're learning it is because it's become popular. So a lot of these guys pretend like they're science-based. And they pretend, well, I read the research and I know how to read it. Well, no, you don't, because you're just discovering something that I've been teaching for years. Lifting tempo, slow te tempo, range of motion. I'm not even going to bother because he's going to say full range of motion because he's clueless. Minimal momentum. So everybody who is previously giving backlash to high-intensity training, well, now when your favorite fitness YouTubers are finally realizing that it is the most effective way to train. Now what? Number three, effort. Let's hear what he says though. People simply don't push their sets hard enough to maximize muscle growth. It's very he says people simply don't push their sets hard enough to maximize muscle recruitment. Where have you guys heard that before? You need to push sets hard. And unfortunately, research consistently shows that most people simply don't push their sets hard enough to maximize muscle growth. It's very common to see people hitting the gym year after year. This is a retarded no exercise. In most cases, the this isn't. There's no reason to do a one arm pull down. There's something called reactionary force. As I pull down, see if you can see me. As I pull down, my body's going to want to come forward. It's reactionary force. The reason we have a chest pad on a row is to prevent reactionary force prevent me from coming forward so that way I can contract harder. That is why this is a dumb exercise. I actually just did a short on this. You don't want to be doing pulling movements on one knee where you cannot counter reactionary force. All right, Just goes again to see these bandwagon hoppers are actually clueless. But he does... Um, let's see. There was... Okay, so he, he mentioned one chart that graphed muscle growth with proximity to failure. And it's evident that, you know, he, he explained one rep in reserve um, up to all the way to failure results in the most growth. But he said, well, you know, two reps in reserve, three reps in reserve, you know, also result in similar growth. True. But this is why you want to train to failure. Because you don't know for certain how many reps in reserve you actually have. You may think you have two reps in reserve, but you actually have five. You, you, because a lot of the times, most of you guys are, are not training all the way to failure. So why do we train to failure? So we can make sure we fall within that range. You could be a little short. So you might as well take the set all the way to failure to make sure you don't fall short of that range for optimal growth. And you can see there's a very sharp increase from two reps in reserve all the way to failure in terms of muscle growth. This is why you want to train to failure. Now, a lot of people um, were under the assumption and, and 
these fitness YouTubers are, I almost don't even want to say it because I know they're just going to watch my video and just regurgitate what I said, but whatever, we'll teach them something. When people start to apply these high intensity training concepts as they popularize and become irrefutable, they're going to notice that they're going to get burnt out. So a lot of people are under the impression you need a certain amount of volume and they're going to push themselves all the way to failure and try to maintain that volume. You cannot do this. You have to reduce volume and usually frequency as intensity gets higher. So a lot of people who complain about burning out by, by training every set to failure is assuming you need more than just one set. Okay, so keep that in mind too. Um, so here's, here's one of the more annoying parts of this video. He talks about choose high tension exercises. Okay. Again, confusing the term tension with effort. When, what he considers high tension exercises are simply exercises that people generally push harder in with more effort. And that is why they recruit more motor units and stimulate more muscle to grow. These exercises don't produce any more tension <laughs> than another exercise. People generally put more effort into them and you'll see why. This. Because tension is king, we need to make sure that we're choosing exercises that place high levels of tension on the target muscles. And this is where I may lose some of you, so I wanna reiterate that this advice is directed at pure hypertrophy training, not strength training or MSC hybrid training. Book, and guess. so, while it is true that you can build a great physique by only using barbell exercises like the squat, bench press, and deadlift, especially if you throw in a pull-up and a free weight row, this approach is probably too basic to maximize muscle growth. So, the exercise he shows, course squat bench deadlift pull up row these are exercises where people generally try harder they push harder when you push harder there's more effort when there's more effort the nervous system recruits more motor units when more motor units are recruited there's more muscle fiber stimulated for growth it's that simple these are not high tension exercises these are high effort exercises. So you will notice throughout the fitness industry, as this tension concept grows, what they mean is effort. They just don't know it yet, okay? So um, this is correct though. These exercises for a lot of people will result in more growth than say machine exercises but not for the reason you're thinking. Not because they're barbell exercises, not because their stabilizers are working, not because these exercises are releasing more uh, anabolic hormones, that's not true. These exercises generally, for people who don't know any better, is gonna result in better growth because they will push harder in them. And of course, the harder you push, the more motor units your nervous system recruits, the more motor units your nervous system recruits, the more muscle fibers are stimulated for growth, and the more growth you have. So one of the more annoying things um, when these uh, fitness YouTubers start to catch on to this high intensity training thing is they're, they don't, they're not gonna understand the terms, they're just gonna kind of throw them out there. Um, and this is an example, okay? So if you wanna learn high intensity training properly, I highly recommend avoiding bandwagon jumpers like Jeff Nibbard and Jeff Cavalier and whoever else. And you go and use my Golden Era system. Go to goldenerasystem.com and learn these concepts properly. Okay. Learn from someone who's been doing this for a decade. Learn from someone who has supervised over 20 5,000 workouts personally and actually knows this stuff. Also, visit Drew Bay's channel. Drew Bay, 
high intensity training. Also check out Doug McGuff. And avoid these people. I'm sure Jeff Nippert has good, for some people I guess, content, not hating on him. But he's way behind, you know? Questions? <laughs> so I just wanted to tell you guys that. Hey, if you guys get Golden Air System today, I'll cut you a deal. I'll give you the home workout program and the advanced arm training program for free. All right, so go to goldenairsystem.com. Check it out. You're going to learn how to do high intensity training or high tension training. <laughs> a lot better than these fools. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to go through and answer some questions if you guys got them. Um, if it's a question um, that I've answered a million times, I'm probably going to skip over it. So, you know, please don't spam the comments if I skip over it. It's just, if it's a question about volume or frequency, whatever, I probably answered it about 17 million times. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba. Okay. I'm going to start from the top, guys. Does the close grip bench press and overhead press hit the long head of the triceps enough to not do isolations? Yeah. Every head of your tri So you may somewhat increase involvement of different heads of a muscle group a little bit based on different biomechanics, but you cannot isolate different heads of the triceps muscle. The triceps is one muscle. There are different heads to it, but all heads contract when you are addressing the function of the triceps. So does do these exercises work the long head of the triceps effectively? Yes. Mike Menser had the nastiest largest triceps and a guy I know said it looked like he had a grapefruit attached to the back of his arm. He didn't do exercises for the long, the short, the, in the medial head of the triceps. He just did a triceps extension. His triceps got huge. Do not get caught up in all this long head, short head, blah, 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 bullshit because you're just going to waste your time and spend way too much time on confusing stuff that makes no difference. Like, think about it. You know, is your Are you 8% body fat yet? 7% body fat yet? If the answer is no, then you shouldn't be working about different heads of your triceps because you can't even see them, okay? Potentially, it makes a difference for professional bodybuilders, but... Um, I'm guessing none of you are professional bodybuilders. All right. Matthew Jelavich. Jelavich. Because people are finding out high volume doesn't work well. Correct. 20 minutes every four days for me never grew more. Yeah. I mean, that's literally kind of in my studios. It would be a 20 to 30 minute workout every, you know, two to four days for most people. Are you bulking? You look huge. I'm not uh, bulking specifically, but I'm bigger than I've ever been. I'm about 220. Um, still, still have some abs. But, um, you yeah, know, I'm not shredded. I'm not bulking. You know what I'm doing? I'm just eating relatively decent, and I'm just training. I'm just um, continuing to just be a brick shit house. <laughs> Obviously, you know, if I were to do, um, you know, something where I needed to be leaner, I would get leaner. But, no. I've just, um, again, you know, I, I explained this before. Your body kind of goes through seasons, it seems. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you're leaner, more ripped. Sometimes you're bigger. Sometimes you're smaller. Um, I guess I'm just going through, you know, brick shit house season. You know? 220 pounds, which is 
No, I never weighed this much. But I'm still, you know, still 12% body fat, so. I'm not doing anything particular. Metal D Yamato. Hit is game changing for me. Because I can be consistent with this approach. Exactly. I used to do high volume. It was overtrained most of the time. My elbows were hurting. Yeah, see, th this is what's great about high intensity or this approach. And Doug McGuff says this. He says, at some point in your life, you're going to need to know high intensity training in order to continue to get the benefits from exercise. You might have a big family. You might have a demanding career. You're generally at some point going to have other obligations that is going to prevent you from going to the gym for two hours a day. In which case, most people generally stop altogether and get out of shape. But the good thing about this approach is that it's sustainable because it doesn't take up a lot of your time and it doesn't hurt you. Jeff was doing ridiculous exercises. Yeah, he was. He really was. I, I, you know, I'll just I'll never understand that one arm grow thing. <laughs> so stupid. <sighs> All right. What improve in cardiovascular system with your hit method? The fact that you reach failure. The fact that the whole series take more than one minute to be completed. Um, okay, so how your cardiovascular system improves. I'll show you. So there's a couple of things that improve um, molecularly, physiologically, biochemically, that allow your, your cardiovascular system to run more efficiently. So Dr. James Steele um, wrote a paper on this. Let me see if I have the... I will show you. I will show you. James. Uh, by the way, I have a YouTube video called uh, Cardio Doesn't Exist or something like that. Um, definitely check that video out. Okay, let's see. All right. So here's, so uh, Dr. James Steele, McGuff, Bruce Lowe um, examined what actually changes in the body that allows your cardiovascular system to improve, okay? And they were under the impression that weight training, excuse me, or strength training does this. So this is what they found. There are, there are aerobic, metabolic, molecular, myocardial changes, physiological changes that happen in the body. So. When we scroll down here, they came up with a nice little chart. Let's see if everybody can see this well. There we go. All right, so this is what happens, and this is why high-intensity training improves your cardiovascular system. Keep in mind, in my training studios, people would go to the doctor after training with me for a few months, and the doctors would be blown away at the changes of their blood pressure, how their lungs sounded, the improvements in their cardiovascular system. And they were only training with me twice a week to failure. Me personally, last time I checked my blood pressure was 120 over 82. <laughs> my uh, cholesterol was 140. I do no steady state cardio at all. And nor did any of my clients. So this is what happens. Your muscular contraction, momentary muscle failure, there's a couple of acute responses, meaning initial responses. These are not the chronic adaptations. One, metabolically, we have an increase in your aerobic metabolism. Obviously, if you're training your muscles really hard, your aerobic with oxygen metabolism is churning very quickly to reduce ATP for your muscles. You have an increase in the AM, the ratio of AMP to ATP. This increase in the AMPK pathway tends to stimulate molecular changes in the cardiovascular system or in the muscles, increases in um, molecular enzymes. Basically, how efficiently your aerobic respiration or aerobic metabolism works. You have an increase in these metabolic enzymes. 
at the molecular level. This allows the aerobic respiration process to work more efficiently. Therefore, the heart, lungs, blood vessels don't have to work as hard to supply them with what they need and increase in cardiovascular fitness. We have an increase in blood flow, shear rate, peripheral vascular blood pressure, and an increase in venous return. This increase in venous return increases left and ventricular function, heart rate, cardiac output. So that increase in venous return improves your cardiovascular improvements as well. Now let's look at the chronic adaptations. So when you, when you push your muscles hard, this is everything that happens. Whether you're doing that jogging, whether you're doing that pushing a sled, whether you're squatting, bench pressing, whatever. Now these are the chronic adaptations. So if we push our muscles like that, if we push our muscles hard and all these things happen down here, these all stimulate chronic long-term adaptations. These. Metabolic adaptations, molecular adaptations, and cardiovascular adaptations. As long as we push our muscles hard. You don't need to jog to do this. You could. It's just inefficient. You don't need to bike, you don't need to swim, you just need to put your muscles hard. Metabolically, we have an increase in mitochondrial enzymes. The mitochondria is what breaks down the substrate, turns it into ATP. So if these work better, you actually add mitochondria as well, something that people think zone two cardio does, but no, anything you push your body hard with will result in mitochondria proliferation, okay? So you have an increase in mitochondria themselves, an increase in mitochondrial enzymes, now your metabolism is working way more efficiently. It can take that pyruvate, turn it into ATP, and get rid of waste much more efficiently. Now the cardiovascular system doesn't have to work as hard. Molecularly, again, mitochondrial proliferation. An increase in type 2A and 1 fibers, basically your type 2 fibers become more oxidative, less glycolytic. That's something... I explain more in my coaching. By the way, if you want to learn all this stuff like this to a super high degree and become an expert, if you're a trainer or you just want to know this stuff for yourself and transform your body, click the link in the description, join my coaching. Then the cardiovascular adaptations. We have an increase in capillaries. Capillaries are what carry blood throughout the body to the working tissue. More capillaries, more um, places, more piping, I guess we'll call it, for blood to flow, lower blood pressure, less strain on the cardiovascular system. All of these chronic adaptations contribute to an increase in VO2 max and economy of movement and overall adaptations in the cardiovascular system. But notice at the top it just says resistance trained to failure. So they found that strength training with a high amount of intensity results in the exact same cardiovascular adaptations as steady state stuff. Just with less wear and tear on your joints and much more efficiently. Hope that makes sense. Anybody have questions about that? By the way, we like I said, we go into this stuff a lot deeper in my coaching program. Um, if you really want to learn this stuff, join there. Uh, but I, I can't break down cardio any better for you guys. I, I, I understand that for some layman people that, that might be hard to understand. Okay? But like th that debunks cardio. Like, like cardio is debunked. Alright? If you like to run, go run. If you like to bike, go bike. I don't care. I just don't want people avoiding the gym and letting their bodies rot in their fucking easy chair because they're under the impression they need to jog for two hours a day. I want people to understand that you can get all these benefits without that huge time commitment. What rep ranges do you advocate for legs? Doesn't matter. 
All the research shows that anything between five and 30 repetitions, as long as you're training to failure, you're recruiting all the motor units in sequential order and stimulating them. Doesn't matter. Uh, all right, going through questions still, guys. Uh, all right, here's one. How much, how many warm up sets before going to one set to failure for each muscle? Honestly, you don't need any, okay? Because if you choose an adequate load, the first three or four moderately challenging repetitions are going to be your warm-up. If you were training in a traditional fashion, the way most people do, fast, jerky, skill-based movements, yes, you're going to want to warm up. But if you are training with the objective in mind to safely and efficiently recruit muscle in a targeted muscle group, then you're not going to need a warm-up because you're already doing them slow, controlled, and safe. Personally, what I do is just one warm-up set on the first exercise. That's it. And then no more warm-ups throughout the entire workout. All right, is your workout program in PDF or it has video guides as well? My Golden Era system is entirely video-based. It's all videos that explain things. It's no PDF. All right, do you think that desensitization, desensitization to the stimulus exists, which would lead to having to use different methods? No, I don't. I don't think desensitization to the stimulus exists. I think that as your body adapts, becomes stronger and bigger, it becomes more reluctant to add this metabolically expensive muscle tissue. And adaptations and gains are harder to get. But I don't think you get desensitized to it. Um, Well, maybe it's desensitization. I mean, if you want to categorize it as desensitization. Um, no, I, I don't think it's desensitization to the stimulus. I think it's just the limit to how much your body is able to respond genetically. Um, and I don't think other methods are going to push you past that. There may be alternative techniques that may cause you to push harder. But blindly employing these techniques is not going to be, you know, um, without a doubt, advantageous. All right. Do you guys do rotator cuff exercises with this approach? I do. Yeah, I mean, you can. Um, you know, unless you're rehabbing your rotator cuff. I don't see the need to do rotator cuff exercises because your rotator cuff is involved with pushing and pulling movements. As long as you are re trying to eliminate momentum, changing changing directions slowly, controlling the weight, not using a load that is too heavy, your rotator cuffs will be stimulated and, and become stronger as well. Um, your rotator cuff is a set, is a, a set of four muscles. Let's see if I can remember them. Um, infraspinatus, supraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis. Four muscles. Just like any muscle, your rotator cuff muscles will respond to strength training by getting stronger. People generally mess up the rotator cuffs because they're loading them in stretched positions and applying force momentum to those positions. Hi, chat. I have a question. Okay. Yeah, that's your question. <laughs> Hit comes up every now and then just because people like to switch training. I feel they never get the reason why they should pick hit instead of volume. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Who knows? 
before the people who can get the reason, you're going to be way ahead of the game. Do you train front delt directly? No, I do not. Um, the function of the front delt is shoulder flexion, internal rotation, humeral adduction. So when you're doing a chest press, look at the front delt. When I'm doing a chest press, I'm humeral, I'm performing humeral adduction, adduction humeral adduction. Oh, I'm performing humeral adduction, shoulder flexion. The front delt is being trained. The belief that you need all these different exercises for each segment of the muscle group is, is pretty much a waste of your time. <clears throat> if I'm working out at a park, a body weight workout three times a week, will I be able to keep my muscle mass and strength with high protein intake? Yeah, definitely. Again, it's not so much what you're doing, it's how you're doing it. Is the intensity of effort adequate? Is the volume of frequency something you can adapt and recover from? That all depends. What is the reason to superset isolation exercises into compound movements, like extension and leg press or triceps into dips? There is no reason. Uh, Mike Menser used to like to do that, but based on research by James Fisher and James Steele, it doesn't appear that supersets provide any better muscle growth than just training to failure. Um, can't believe you have 140 cholesterol. Yeah. It's the level of a vegan. <laughs> I'm definitely not a vegan. It would be incredible. However, I don't think it really has anything to do with the type of training. Don't you think? No, my cholesterol levels is mostly due to good diet. I've been eating well for a long, long time. Best gym in Tampa. MI40. Ben Pakulski's gym. Or Ben Pakulski's old, old gym? I think his wife owns it now. His wife's always there, so I'm, I'm guessing. I think... Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to go into Ben Pakulski's personal life, but... Um, his wife is there all the time, or ex-wife, I don't know. Do you think there could be a different cardiovascular adaptation in terms of cardiac output and ventri ventricular wall size if training only one rep max? Um, I have to suspect that increasing time under tension improves CV. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Read that paper. Read that paper. Um, that's the thing. It's like, are you asking? I mean, the yeah, there is a slight increase in ventricular wall size as a result of the cardiovascular improvement. Um, are you asking if just training to failure is better or increasing time under tension improves CV? Well, will the increased time under tension um, change these acute responses possibly I mean more time under tension may increase maybe some of the metabolic components but um, not necessarily elevate the AMPK pathway more or any of these other things I don't know all right do you find it harder to get clients as a hit coach no with HIT, you can have more clients. So why would the fitness industry care about earning money? Well, the th well, here's the thing. With high-intensity training, people, you know, in my studios, I only had people come once or twice a week. Compare that to, you know, a lot of other trainers may have people coming three or four times a week. So you kind of make less money. But my clients were my clients for several years because they – they don't get injured and they see results. So as a hit coach, your clients always get results. They never get hurt. So they come to you forever, forever. Sometimes, you know, they would try to go and do it on their own and they, they would come back and say, I can't do this on my own. I can't do this 
on my own in the gym the same way you can put me through these workouts. And then they're your client forever. Um, so yeah, I think high intensity training is an extremely good business model. Um, it's a little repetitive, you know, for seven years I did it in my own studios, 50 to 70 sessions a week. Burns you out for sure, but it's definitely a good, uh, good business model. Since COVID, I decided to just teach it online because, um, you know, <laughs> you, you know, I got, you gotta be careful what you can say about the old Kufid. Can I make more sets for some muscles also to failure just to make sure that I gave all that I can? Yeah, you can do that. Uh, can we improve some muscles if they are like left behind according to others? Yeah, so if a muscle is lagging in this development, there are techniques to um, have it catch up. This is something I teach in my coaching. There's a lot more to it than that. So if you want to learn how to bring up lagging muscle groups, join my coaching program. It's unlimited. It's lifelong. You get access to me as your coach for life. Because at some point, you're going to learn so much you're not going to need me. That's why I can do that. Link is in the description. What machines would you choose if you were to create your own studio for training? MedX Nautilus? Well, remember, I had two personal training studios. <laughs> I already did this. And I had MedX and Nautilus. Yeah. Nautilus 2ST, Nautilus Nitro, and MedX. I'll bring a picture up sometime. All right. What would generate superior results? Slow repetitions or st time static contraction training? Neither. Neither would provide superior results. In the long run, they would be the same if intensity is added. Any benefit adding inclined chest press if already doing regular horizontal chest press? Yeah, sure. An inclined chest press will work the front delt, clavicular head of the chest more than a flat chest press. But for most of you guys, if you're not, you know, 10% body fat or less with, with significant muscle development, you're not going to notice a lagging clavicular head of your pec. All right, a couple more questions, then KAT, I'm out of here. All right, I've been training for six months doing four sets per exercise, five exercises per muscle group, but after learning from Mentor and you, I'm getting results. Told you. Go to goldenerasystem.com, guys. Try, try the program. I'm giving you three programs for 47 bucks today. Golden Era System is 47 bucks, and you get three programs. Get my hit home workout, also advanced arms. All right, one more question. What's the time under load range you recommend? Anything from 30 seconds to two minutes. That's it. Anything in between, equally effective, basically preference. All right, guys, that's it for me today. Go ahead, hit the like, subscribe, bell notification icon if you want to get this guy right here with two free programs, home workout and advanced arm training program, go to goldenerasystem.com. If you want me as your personal coach and learn from me directly, and have me transform your physique into the best you could ever possibly have, there's a link in the description to join my coaching.